Hey everybody, thanks for joining me again on another On This Day in Canadian Military History uh, live stream, uh, talking about uh, a different subject here today. So we're going to be talking about one particular training flight that ended in a uh, tragedy, outright tragedy. Uh, the entire crew was killed. But we're going to really dig into what that means, who the crew was, their lives, how they got to that point, and, and all of that stuff. And we have a really great guest who's going to be knows this stuff in and out from the area where the crash was and has been looking at this for a long time. So I'm really excited to have uh, Jane uh, Gulliford Lowe's on the show today. She's written some, she's written one book on um, one squadron. There's some links below to check that out. Uh, so can I get the background? This is mentioned in that book, uh, but she wants to do more with it potentially in the future, but we'll get into that. But anyway, check those out and do, if you haven't so far, please subscribe to the channel, please. I do need as many of those as I can get. So if you haven't yet, please do so. So hi, Jane. Thanks for joining me. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have you on the channel today. Hi, good evening, everybody. Great to be here. Yeah, so so again, thanks for coming. Uh, this subject is is intensely fascinating to me. I mean, you reach out to me on Twitter just being like, are you interested in a Canadian crew that crashed? And I go, of course. But then when I you sent me all the, the preliminary stuff about that, and then I really read the blog very closely, um, and I'll link the blog and everything that started all this down below uh, afterwards. It's not up there yet, but uh, it will be uh, after. Is is the level of detail and, and the understanding you have of all the different parts. So uh, I was just wondering if we can do a quick, just a quick um, explanation of what this is so we don't you know move into it later, but I would just like to start okay. off that, and then you had a plan and we'll move through that if that's okay. Yeah, sure. So tonight we're going to be talking about um, a crash involving a Whitley bomber um, with a mainly Canadian crew, which happened on the 17th of October 1944. This was a training flight, so it was a rookie crew who hadn't actually been assigned to a um, squadron as yet. They hadn't taken part in any operations and they were still at a very early stage of, the, of their training. And their aircraft crashed about a mile or so from where I am now um, in the County Durham in the northeast of England. And I've sort of explored their story as part of uh, the research for my uh, recent book, Above Us the Stars, which is about um, a 10 squadron um, bomber command crew, but it also um, deals with um, what was happening in the Second World War in this little corner of England at the time as well. Yeah, so that, that's great. I mean, it, it, from that description, it doesn't sound like there's much going on here, but there is a lot going on here. And you have a lot going on here. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, you, and you've got a personal connection to this, which is yeah, I great. I mean, we had a show last night where there was a personal connection. And I think that just brings some richness to this understanding that is often missing. So it, it's going to be great to hear your perspective on all of this. Okay. Right. Okay, so while researching um, my second book, Above Us the Stars, um, I began interviewing, um, as part of that process, local residents who'd been children during the Second World War. And that's when I stumbled upon the story of this air crash, um, which occurred only a mile or so from where I am now in Seaton Village in County Durham. Now, there's a Seaton Village in Canada as well, but it's not the same place. <laughs> um, now, I've lived in Seaton um, almost all my adult life, and I'd never heard about this incident before. Um, but I have a dual connection to this incident, both geographic and personal. Um, as I've mentioned, the air crash involved a mostly Canadian crew in the early stage of their training um, from RAF Kinloss in the far north of Scotland. Now, my great uncle, Flight Sergeant Jack Clyde, DFM, I think we've got a picture of Jack um, up there. Yep. Um, that one up. That's Jack, yeah, age 20. Um, he'd been posted to Kinloss as a wireless operator instructor just a couple of weeks previously. He just completed a, a full tour of, um, of 30 operations uh, with Bomber Command against the most incredible odds from the Bat Battle of the Ruhr in spring um, 1943 um, right up to the Battle of Berlin in late 43, um, early 44. So Jack was considered to be an experienced veteran. Bear in mind, he just turned 22 when he was sent to um, carry out um, instruction um, for wireless operators for the trainee crews. So he was one of the instructors um, of this crew. But that's just some kind of weird coincidence, which I only found out much later on. So at that time, an RAF bomber crewman had around about a 27 percent chance of surviving a tour of operations without being killed, without being taken prisoner of war, or without being injured. 
attrition rates, that's actual death rates, but the time when Jack was flying with his crew, I think we've got a picture of Jack and his crew as well. Oh, yeah, there they are. Um, just completed their operation there. Um, was around about 55%, which is absolutely enormous. These guys were the first crew on their squadron to complete a tour that year. The rest had all been killed or shot down or, or, you know, or, or taken prisoner. Um, that's quite a sobering thought. So Jack had got through this tour and he was then sent sort of as a rest, if you like, to become an instructor. And that's when he came into contact with um, this, this Canadian crew. Jack was a wireless operator, so that was his um, his job in, tr in training as well. So he would have been training um, the crew's wireless operator in particular, both in the classroom and also um, accompanying them on training flights as well. Okay, so I just want to explain a little bit about the background of where we are and where this crash actually took place. And um, if we can have a look at um, map th at photograph three, yep, there we are. So we are down, um, halfway down that uh, that map there, we're in County Durham, the little town of Seaham Harbour, which is on the Durham coast um, in the far north of England. Um, up the top there, you can see uh, the marker for 19 occupational train, sorry, operational training unit at RAF Kinloss, which is where this crew were based, which is where Jack was based and their instructor, and from where they set off on the night that they were killed. Now, at the time that we're talking about, um, during the Second World War, County Durham was a largely rural county, but it was peppered with coal mines and mining villages. Durham itself, the ancient um, cathedral, a uh, university city, survived bombing almost in sca on scales. People tend to think of the, of the Blitz as just happening in London or in the bigger cities, um, such as uh, Manchester, Glasgow, uh, Birmingham, Southampton. But this little corner of northeast England was actually bombed very heavily during the Second World War because of its links with industry. Um, and it was being bombed right late up until 1943, right from the get go in August 1940 during the Battle of Britain. So the shipyards of Sunderland and Newcastle, which are a little further north than Seaham, were targeted in particular. And Seaham, which was just a very small town, still is. Um, probably at that time of around about 15 to 20,000 residents, was also bombed heavily on about four or five separate occasions with significant loss of life. The reason for that was the town had three coal mines and a small port from which the collier vessels shipped coal to other parts mm. of the UK. So they were targeted um, both by Luftwaffe bombers based in Denmark and Holland, and the ships, the colliers, were targeted by U-boats um, as, as they came out of the harbour, and dozens of them were... were sunk. My own grandmother was bombed out of her house in May 1943 when she was eight months pregnant. I think we've got a photograph, that's photograph four of, um, of the aftermath of that bombing raid. Um, this is just around the corner from her house. Uh, so as you can see, that's pretty substantial and a pretty huge amount of damage. I think around about 35 people were, were killed in that raid. Wow. Um, my grandmother um, lost all her windows and doors and um, had to uh, go and live with, with a relative, but was fortunately unscathed. Mm. Um, however, by October 1944, when this incident occurred, when this air crash occurred, Luftwaffe raids had long since ended. The Luftwaffe had been more or less um, defeated and things were beginning to return slowly to normal in my hometown. Um, just northwest of, of Seam um, is the village of Seaton, which is basically a small agricultural village um, with several farms scattered around and about. And beyond that, um, close to another mining village, Merton, is the hamlet of Slingley. That's perched on a slight hill. It's really just a couple of farmhouses and a handful of cottages surrounded by farm, farmland. It's quite flat, um, very agricultural, not many sort of houses or, or buildings around about. And that's where um, the, the crash actually occurred. So on the evening of Tuesday, 17th of October, 1944, a Whitley bomber, uh, call sign AD685, took off from RAF Kinloss on a training flight. Now, at that time, RAF Kinloss was the home of 19 operational training unit, OTU for short, where air crews were trained to fly twin engine bombers before moving on to the heavy bombers, um, the Halifaxes and Lancasters 
in a heavy conversion unit. Thereafter, they join up with their operational squadrons and commence actual bombing operations over enemy targets. So RAF Kinloss had been an RAF base from the late 1930s and was right up until 2012 when it was decommissioned. Wow. It's now come to um, some army barracks. Um, some of the earliest bombing raids of the war were flown from um, RAF Kinloss against German naval and military targets, um, particularly in Norway, again um, using Whitley bombers. However, it was subsequently converted to an occupational training unit and became home to 19 OTU. The surrounding countryside was sadly littered with debris from numerous crashes involving um, trainee crews. And I think we've got a, a picture of the, of the cemetery there um, from the Commonwealth War Graves Commission, um, which shows just some of the, of the, the trainee crews who were, who were killed around there. So I'm going to explain a little bit more about the training process. So what we have to bear in mind is that all air crew are volunteers. Um, through the Commonwealth Air Training Plan, um, air crew were, were recruited and trained in various different um, Commonwealth countries, particularly Canada, but also South Africa, um, also New Zealand, also Australia, and also even in Ceylon and Rhodesia. Um, air crew would be recruited there, but it was also um, a reverse process as well in that air crew from Britain would be sent to those countries for training simply because it just wasn't safe um, due to um, enemy action, due to Luftwaffe air raids, etc., to train them here. The skies were already too full. Um, mm -hmm. There just wasn't um, the facilities here to do that. Also, Britain's a very small country <laughs> and you need a lot of space to be training all of these air crews. So mm -hmm. it was sort of a, a, a double-edged scheme, if you like, to recruit um, air crews from uh, Commonwealth countries, but also to train both them and also train British guys um, for the Air Force too. So when you volunteered um, for Bomber Command and all Bomber Command air crew were volunteers because of the very high attrition rates, you could not be compelled to serve in Bomber Command. Um, initially, you would be screened for what's called PNB training. You would sit some assessment tests to see what sort of role you were suited to within Bomber Command and within an aircrew. PNB stands for Pilot, Navigator and Bomb Aimer. Those were the most technical um, jobs, if you like, and the remaining jobs were Flight Engineer, Gunners and Wireless Operators. They were considered to be more trades rather than professions, if you like. Mm -hmm. um, so a typical um, recruit, once he'd been um, screened and was decided what role he was going to have, uh, was sent off for square bashing uh, training for about six weeks. Um, then he will be sent off for his specialist trade training. So the pilots will go off to flying school, the gunners to gunnery school, the wireless ops to wireless school, etc. And these schools were scattered throughout the, the Commonwealth um, and the USA as well. And lots of pilots trained um, in America as, as well as in Canada. Mm -hmm. um, for Canadians who were recruited um, for the Royal Canadian Air Force, but also for the Royal Air Force, um, most but not all would complete their trade training in Canada before being shipped over to the UK to complete the next part of their training. So we have around about 72,000 um, air crew who were recruited um, from Canada um, for the Commonwealth Air Training Programme. Um, and something like 131,000 air crew were trained in Canada under the plan altogether. That is a massive number. Mm -hmm. So after completing their, their trade training, they would then be posted to an occupational trade training unit within the UK for around two months. And it's here that they would begin to form into crews. There were dozens of different types of occupational training units. Um, three main types reflecting the makeup of the Air Force at, the, at that time. So there were specialist ones for Coastal Command, there were specialist OTUs for Fighter Command and for Bomber Command. By far the highest number went through Bomber Command OTUs simply because your average bomber's got seven crew members, whereas your fighter has generally only got one. Um, so the type of job that you'd been lined up for would determine where you went. So 19 OTU is a specialist um, bomber crew training unit. 
Now, if we have a look at photograph six, um, that's an, an extract from Jack's own logbook, which I'm lucky enough to own, which basically explains the kind of things that um, you'll be doing, the kind of training that you'll be undergoing during your time with OTU. So you can see that Jack is also flying Whitley's at this time, which is in January 1943. And he is completing various different um, exercises in the air, cross country, uh, bombing, um, training, um, landing, what's called loop circuits and bumps, uh, where you're just basically taking off, landing and flying back down again. Um, and they'll be doing this day in, day out. Um, I particularly like the fact that one of his first pilots was pilot officer, or oh, sorry, flight sergeant death. Um, <laughs> Yeah. You can't have inspired much confidence in his. I mean, in his <laughs> yeah, there it is. I mean, yeah, sorry, just to also give you a little break. I mean, that's just, yeah, I mean, <laughs> the apostrophe helps a little, but I mean, yeah. <laughs> punctuation tends to take a bit of an edge off. But yeah, that's got to be, uh, well, unfortunate for that person too to always have to be like, oh, I am Flight Sergeant Death. And, you know, <laughs> time he meets you. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, sorry, I just can't help but laugh. That's just, I guess, one of those things for more, right? It feels like something out of Catch-22. Yeah, exactly. I think there was certainly a lot of humour, um, which was essential, um, very black humour um, in, mm. in, in Bomber Command and the RAF generally. And that's, I think that's how they, you know, coped with, with what they had to do. Mm -hmm. So you will see um, there um, the name of Pilot Officer Pennycott crops up quite a lot. And Pennycott was actually the, um, the pilot who Jack um, crewed up with um, and who we actually flew his operational tour with. Um, I'll explain a little bit about crewing up because that's quite important in this context. Um, you weren't given a particular crew to serve with. You weren't allotted to a crew. The process of crewing up was quite a sort of random process. Um, what would happen is that all the, the air crews would be put together in a hangar, given cups of tea and told to go and off and chat to each other and basically form themselves into crews mm -hmm. so quite often it was a case of oh he looks like a nice lad i'll see if he needs a gunner or oh you look like a decent chap i'll have you as my navigator it was all a very informal process but that's how they began to bond as crews and that that's how they were started off so by this time it's likely that this crew um our Canadian crew that we're going to talk about tonight had already gone through that crewing up process and had already been put together as a crew. We don't know which um, squadron they were destined for. That possibly hadn't even been decided at this type time. It also hadn't possibly been decided which type of aircraft they were going to be flying, although it would have been Halifaxes or Lancasters. I think something like 70% of Canadian air crew flew Halifaxes, and I have a particular fondness for that aircraft because it's the, the aircraft that, uh, that Jack and his, his crew flew. Yeah, and um, just to kind of put on my uh, Lancaster uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. sweater that I bought uh, in the middle of the heat wave that was late August here, but uh, but yeah, I finally cooled down so I can wear this thing. But uh, yeah, because I that's what the museum I was at had had the Lancaster, and that's a big problem. yeah. Well, there's such a sort of impression sort of among the population generally that you know World War Two was won by Spitfires and Lancasters. Yeah, not sure that wasn't the case. Um, yeah. Certainly, the Halif Halifax did a lot of the, the heavy lifting and did a huge um, part of the um, of the operational. Um, also bore a huge part of the operational burden uh, for Bomber Command. But that's a whole other story. That's a whole other of my bugbears. So. Yeah, we can uh, probably have you back on and talk about that. Yeah, we'll talk about Halifax <laughs> another day. Yeah. So for the moment, then, this crew is learning to fly um, in, in, in Whitley's. Um, so once they had done a few weeks, um, probably two months max, um, in the occupational trade training unit, Flying um, older, usually twin engine bombers, they would then transfer to what's called a heavy conversion unit to learn to fly the type of aircraft that they'd be flying operationally when they joined up with their squadron. So that will be decided at that point. You either flew Halifaxes for a tour or you flew Lancasters. Some people switched and then did a second tour in a different aircraft, mm -hmm. um, but that's the way that it would normally work. Um, so when you joined a heavy conversion unit believe it or not you'd only be there for about three or four weeks at most mm -hmm. so you and your crew are only going to have and um, three or four weeks to learn to fly the bomber which you are going to be flying on operations over germany and jack my uncle and his crew were at their hcu for only three weeks in march 1943 
bearing in mind all of their operations would have taken place at night because the RAF was involved pretty much solely in, in night bombing at this point, whereas the US Air Force, Army Air Force were doing it in daytime. Um, they flew a Halifax at night in training for a grand total of 13 hours before being sent to do it for real. That's just nothing, is it? Yeah, I mean, sorry, just to cut in here real quick, because I've been doing quite a bit of reading about particularly the, the, the training plan and the personal experiences. And one of the things I take, and you're just reinforcing it, is chunks of the training are... <sighs> They kind of describe them as long and kind of boring. I mean, you're flying around the prairies of Canada. There's not much going on in smaller planes. And then by the end, it's just so condensed and so quick. It's just it, it's just this kind of strange dichotomy to me. But I guess, I mean, it makes sense once you've got this lack of equipment and the need for new crews, as you already talked about, the attritional rates are huge and high. It's It makes perfect sense. But again, it's something to keep in mind, too, when, when, when you know, thinking about all this is how little training they had with the weapons and the planes they're actually using. Yeah. I think you had just something like a 20% chance of surviving your first five operations, which is testament to that, Yeah, which is pretty grim. I know um, with Jack and his crew, they joined uh, 10 Squadron in May um, 1943 with uh, 18 other crews. And by July, 11 of those crews were dead. That's quite a sobering thought isn't it mm -hmm. yeah it does. so this crew the crew that we're going to be talking about tonight our canadian crew didn't even get that far no. so they were killed um during their training at the otu so let's talk a little bit about the crew then so all but one of the six crew on board whitley ad 685 are canadian um recently arrived at kinloss to commence their training for the command just like thousands of other young canadian men had done before them. So we have a picture, I think, of um, of the pilot, Flying Officer Kenneth Reed. that's Kenneth, who's mm -hmm. from Alberta. We then have um, our navigator, Flying Officer Walter Wall. Um, he just looks like a kid, doesn't he? he, he, so he yeah, I mean, sorry, just an aside here, not to but I, we were talking before, me, me and Jane, about this, putting this together, and I, and I found these photos, and it's just, the, well, there'll be more, but they're just very striking how they're taken. The youth, the, the, the color of their eyes to me, I know it just sticks in my mind because I, especially because we know where this is going to go. And it's yeah. just, it's so heartbreaking. Again, like last night, we did we did another live stream and it's just so heartbreaking to, to know these stories, but they are important. So I just want to keep that in mind. Again, these are some, some very young men. Yeah. Yeah. Then we have um, our mid upper gunner, um, Alexander Sundstrom. Looks like he had a bit of a, a bit of a swagger going there. <laughs> does, yeah, he looks like a confident young fella, doesn't he? he? Does, yeah. yeah. And then we have our young air gunner, John Dowding. Um, oh, sorry, that's uh, Leslie Olmstead. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, there we go. Uh, that's, yeah. John. yeah, that's John. Yeah, he looks about 12. Yeah. He does. He looks yeah. like he's playing dress up. He does. So, um, Walter, um, Alexander, um, and John are all Ontarians. And the eldest member of the crew at the grand old age of 29 was Sergeant Leslie Olmstead, um, and he hailed from Saskatchewan. And the only British member of the crew who we don't have um, a photograph of was 19-year-old Sergeant Ernest Levers from Derbyshire. That's um, Ernest's grave. He was a wireless operator, and he was one of Jack's students at the OTU. Uh, so I John Dowding. So I just want to take a quick second because I wanted to thank uh, Andy Bashford who got that picture for me. He went to the site uh, last week and, and took this photo and very grateful for him for doing so. Well, that's great. Yeah, thank you. So if we can go back to, to John. Um, now, John looks very young and that's because he is. John Dowding was only 17 when he was killed. He'd lied about his age to join the Royal Canadian Air Force. And he'd hoped to follow the illustrious footsteps of his elder brother, Harry, who was a squadron leader and a Spitfire ace, who'd been awarded the uh, DFC, the Distinguished Flying Cross, um, for his heroics earlier in the war. And his parents, perhaps hoping that um, John would follow in his brother's um, illustrious footsteps, um, were complicit in the deceit, and they signed mm -hmm. John's enlistment papers 
and provided him a letter in support, giving their permission for him to join the Air Force. He was actually just 16 when he enlisted on the 3rd of August 1943. And he, he looks it. I mean, I don't know how anybody didn't sort of pick up on this or query it at the time, but yeah, it, it's really just horrifying. Really I've talked about this on the on the channel and other shows uh, because this has come up in examples of the First World War and the Second World War, and it just wow. there's got to be someone complacent in this. They have to look the other way and just allow this to happen. Like you said, there par was parents involved in this, and whoever was involved in the recruiting at this point had to let this go. I mean, he's clearly very young. I mean, when I ever when I was still putting these photos together, every time I go through, I'm like. He doesn't belong here. He just sticks he doesn't. Out. So I mean, it's just something happened that just let this go through. Yeah, it, it, it's such a tragedy. It, mm -hmm. it is. I mean, it's always a always a tragedy um, when these guys lose their lose their lives. But for for him, he was he was just a little boy. Mm -hmm. it's, it's it's so sad. So that night, um, the crew were undertaking a routine training operation, a cross country exercise, um, down the eastern coast of Scotland and Northern England, following a regular route taken by and the rookie crews designed to introduce them to night flying before they move on to the larger bombers. So as mentioned, um, the guys are flying um, at Armstrong Whitworth Whitley bomber, um, which is a twin engine bomber introduced um, to the RAF in 1937. By the time the war broke out and by the time Bomber Command gets going operationally in sort of 4041, this aircraft is already obsolete. It's already past its best. Its technology is, you know, is old. Um, the Whitley first saw service with 10 Squadron, which was Jack Squadron as well, um, until it was phased out in favour of the Halifaxes in late 1942. But it continued to be used for uh, transports and for uh, training operations in particular. I think we have a photograph of the, the Whitley at um, uh, photograph 11. Yeah, there we go. So we're talking about a big piece of kit here. Yeah. So, sorry, just a quick question here, because we have a question from, from Shell Drake, who's often a big supporter of the show and channel and is often on. But uh, anyway, so he says with the Whitley Crew of 5 or 6 uh, and the crews of the bigger ones, did they add somebody? Was that done afterwards? Yes, they were they just given some, like, were they just given someone or did they like recruit someone to join them? No, they were usually assigned somebody. Um, so you would normally have a crew of five. But in this case, they had six on this particular occasion because they had two gunners rather than just one. Right. Um, but normally um, you would be assigned um, the flight engineer and the mid upper gunner would normally join later on um, towards the end. But once you got to the HCU, once you got to the heavy conversion, you, you'll be given um, a mid upper gunner, and um, if you're flying Halifaxes, um, and um, a flight engineer as well. So they will be added to the later stage. Perfect, thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the, the Whitley had been used extensively in, in the early part of the war. It took part um, in lots of the um, propaganda raids, dropping leaflets mm. over Germany. It took part in some very early bombing missions. Um, it took part in some of the early bombing missions on Italy. Lots of people don't realise that Italy was bombed so extensively, mm. but it was, um, particularly in the early part of the war, um, and particularly in the north, industrial areas such as um, Genoa and Turin were bombed quite heavily. Um, but by the time that, that these guys got their Whitley, um, it was basically a heap of trash. They were constantly going wrong. They were, you know, extremely obsolete. They were very, very old. They were quite poorly maintained. And they used to really get the hammer during um, training with, with the training crews. But obviously, you're not going to give a rookie crew a brand new spanking Lancaster um, to practice in. Yeah, I mean, there's already yeah. as it is, so yeah. Yeah, so this is basically that the, this is where they the, the, they learned their trade. Um, so yeah, so there would have been normally five, but on this particular night they had six because they had two gunners. And had they got to the HCU to learn to fly their Halifax or Lancaster, they would have had seven. So at twenty one forty five hours on um, the night of seventeenth of October. October, AD 685 is recorded as missing. They lose contact, um, can loss lose its contact with the aircraft. And half an hour or so later, um, in the midst of a severe thunderstorm, um, several farmers close by, to, right to, to where I am now, Bill Bulmer up at Stockfold Farm, snowed in at Seaton, 
and the Ford at Slingley Hill Farm, all of whose families are still farm around here, and these farms are all are all still here, and were disturbed by the arrival of police officers who informed them that an aircraft was missing, was believed to have come down on their land. So the three farmers and all their farmhands were then asked to form um, a search party to assist in locating the crash site, which is norming feet in the dark, um, in the middle of a very rural area, and a search for survivors. Sadly, there weren't any. Um, a subsequent investigation revealed that the aircraft had developed problems over the coast, probably due to a combination of turbulence and icing. So uh, our pilot decided to come in land to see if he could, presumably see if he could, he could land it somewhere, um, perhaps make a crash landing. But sadly and quite horrifyingly for the crew, the aircraft had begun to break up in midair. Now, the reason for the dis disintegration was never firmly established. Um, control lost in cloud was listed on the accident documents. Fairly frequent lashes, flashes of lightning were reported um, by another Whitley bomber in the vicinity at the same time. And a local um, weather observatory in Durham reported a violent localised electrical storm moving through the area from the west at half past nine that evening. So perhaps extreme turbulence from the storm had caused the aircraft to break up. Perhaps it was just so old and so knackered that it was going to break up anyway. We just, or it could have been a combination of all of those factors. And we'll never know. Um, if we can have a look at um, photograph um, 12, which I think is the map of the crash site. Yeah, so if we can zoom in on that a little bit, maybe I'm not sure. Um, yeah, this um, map was given to me by the uh, members of the Merton um, Historical Society who researched the crash a few years ago. And it was given to them by an American historian, I believe. So it's not my map, um, but I just wanted to sort of make sure that people are aware that they don't take credit for this. But if you can just scroll out a tiny little way, you can see the coast um, just to your top right. So you can see how it's come in um, over the coast. And then it began to fly inland. It was actually following the path of um, a street called the Avenue. Um, yeah. We can't even begin to comprehend the horror experienced by those poor boys on board as the aircraft began to disintegrate as it flew over um, CM Harbour, the new um, Deanside housing estate, which had just been built roughly on a course above the street called the Avenue. One wing fell to the ground by the George Inn, the public house on that very street. Another quarter of a mile or so um, further on, landing in someone's backyard up in um, Mount Pleasant. It's a miracle that no one on the ground was killed or injured. And the two engines fell in farm and beyond, while the fuselage, which is basically all that was left, um, hurtled into the ground um, around about 250 miles an hour, um, just behind Slingley Hill Farm, not too far away from the now disused railway line. You can see the railway line running from the, from the middle um, top right down to the bottom left hand corner there. Um, there was no fire, no explosion, and the bodies of the crew were found intact, but obviously with horrific impact injuries in and around the upturned fuselage. There was no there was no time for them to, to bail out or to evacuate or to do anything. And all of this would have happened just in the matter of a few seconds. So from the the final impact site to the coast, you, you're talking about a mile and a half. So when you are flying at roughly 250, 260 miles an hour, this is just a matter of seconds. Mm -hmm. it's, it, it's over, you know, um, and it's just horrendous. So the incident's well remembered by um, the older residents of Seaton and Merton. And one of my relatives, Alan Lowe's, who lived in Merton his entire life, still has very vivid memories of going to view the wreckage with his friend Alan Charlton the next morning. And he can still recall very, very vividly indeed the sight of the, the bodies of these poor boys um, underneath um, the tarpaulin. And he specifically remembers the fact that all the dead men still had on their, their flying boots. He was just six years old at the time, and that's something which has, has stuck with him ever since. Um, I just um, put something about, about the crash on our local um, Facebook page the other day, and somebody um, contacted me to say that she could remember this incident happening because some of the wreckage fell into their backyard. Mm. Uh, they thought that the Luftwaffe had come back, um, that they were being bombed again. Um, and also um, one of the, the farmers, um, his son had contacted me to say that they actually had a seat 
from the aircraft for wow. years on their farm, which they used um, as a seat in one of their tractors. Um, but the, the wreckage um, and the, the bodies were cleared within about 24 hours um, from the site. That, that was the usual um, process because these kind of crashes were so frequent. Um, there was, you know, an organization in place uh, to come and retrieve the bodies, to clean up the site, to take away the, the wreckage, etc. It was all, you know, a very, very slick operation. And there is a medical report on, on John Dowding, which is mentioned um, in both the Sarnia Historical website, which covers this crash, and also John Boileau and, and Dan Bach's um, book, Too Young to Die, which is about Canada's boy soldiers, sailors and airmen, um, from which I took a lot of information about um, the crash. And the, the medical report on, on poor John noted multiple his injuries, head completely pulped, multiple abrasions with extensive tissue loss, fra multiple fractures um, to all of his arms and legs, basically. I prefer to think about John in his uniform with his lovely hat on there, he's very, looking very proud of himself and these lovely bright blonde hair, blue eyes and soft cheeks. He's still a child. That's how I prefer to think of him. So the bodies of the crew were removed immediately. They all, the Canadians were all buried together in Harrogate Regional Cemetery, um, which is now called Stonefall Cemetery, alongside so many of their compatriots. There's a large um, Commonwealth War Graves um, cemetery there, um, with hundreds and hundreds of, of burials, mainly of um, Commonwealth air crews and British air crews who've been killed um, in training. And there were lots of Canadians buried there. Sergeant Leavers, the only um, British member of the crew, um, was returned to his family in, in Derbyshire and he is buried with his parents. So young John Dowding's parents were informed of his death by telegram just three days after the crash on the 20th of October. Can you imagine how horrific it must have been for them to have received that telegram knowing full well that they had almost being complicit in the, in the tragedy, if you like, by allowing him to enlist, to lie about his age and to enlist in the Air Force at the age of just 16. And how does the parent ever come to terms with that sort of loss anyway? Um, the telegram read, deeply regret to advise that your son, Pilot Officer John Frederick Dowding, J46041, that's his service number, was killed in active service overseas October 17th, stop Please accept my profound sympathy. Stop. Letter follows. 35 words for the loss of a child. A second telegram followed two days later and to inform them that their son's funeral service was to take place in Harrogate the very next day. By the time the telegram reached them at 162 John Street, Sarnia, Ontario, their boy had already been buried. John's commanding officer at Kinloss Group Captain Cole had written to them on the 27th of October, relaying the details of the funeral service and actually enclosing um, some photographs um, of the service too. And the letter that he wrote to them, which appears on the Sarnia um, Historical Society um, site and in the book to which I've just referred, reads, As air gunner of his aircraft, he took off in the evening of Tuesday 17th of October to carry out a cross-country detail. Contact was maintained with the aircraft until 21-22 hours, which was the last contact made. Information was received later that the aircraft was crashed at approximately 21.30 hours, a few miles inland west of Seam Harbour, near Durham. It may be of some consolation to you to know that death must have been instantaneous. Not much consolation, but there we go. The cause of the death, the cause of the accident has not yet been established. A group Captain Cole had written that same letter, only with the names and circumstances and dates changed hundreds of times before, sadly. As I say, he wrote again to the Dowdings at closing some black and white photographs of the funeral service and the burial. Now, if you walk along the old railway line now, which is now a trackway uh, popular with um, cyclists and dog walkers um, from Seaton Village, where I live, um, towards um, Merton, you can pass Slingley Hill Farm on your right, silhouetted against the wind turbines. I think we have a, a picture of that. Um, it could be part 13. Don't we can zoom on that a little bit. Shows you a little bit about the... Of, of the lie of the land. Um, so the aircraft crashed in the bottom right hand um, corner of that photograph, just in that field down there. Obviously the wind turbines weren't there then. Um, 
Um, but you can get an idea of the sort of lie of the land and sort of how rural it is. Um, so you can still see the crash site, you can walk past there, but there's no hint of the tragic events of 17th of October 1944, and there's no trace of anything untoward. There's no memorial to, the, to these young men, and their story has by and large been forgotten. Some 8,240 Canadians were killed on operations just with Bomber Command, and another 1,740 died from non-operational causes, the vast majority in training exercises and training accidents. And John Dowding's parents subsequently arranged for the following epitaph to be carved on his headstone. He challenged those who would destroy the innocent and the way of life he loved so well. Which is quite a, a thoughtful epitaph, I think. Mm -hmm. Great. Now, the Commonwealth War Graves Commission have recently featured um, John's story at um, Stone, Stone Falls Cemetery. Mm -hmm. If you can click onto um, photograph 14, we can see um, John's grave there and a little bit of, of his story. So John and the rest of the, the boys in his crew are not forgotten. They are very well remembered. And I hope to go and visit them um, in the not too distant future. So the Merton um, Local Histori History Society ended a project on the crash, as I mentioned a few years ago, and I'm determined to ensure that the crew properly remembered around here. Like me, so many local residents were completely aware of, of what had happened, particularly as the, um, the Second World War now begins to pass from living memory as well. So I've written an article about the crash on my website, and it's also mentioned in my book about Jack Clyde and his crew. Um, so Jack actually lived, um, just was from just a couple of miles away from where um, that this crew, uh, this crew were killed uh, by some other um, strange coincidence. Um, discussions are ongoing with the local parish council um, to um, try and set up some sort of permanent memorial now um, near the crash site uh, or on the, the village green here. And for the last few years, a poppy wreath has been laid on the village green too um, at Seaton to remember the crew on Remembrance Sunday. So we are making sure that they are remembered, which I think is, is nice. So there's a lot more information about this incident in um, the book that I've referred to, uh, John Boileau and Dan Black's book, Too Young to Die, Canada's Boys, Soldiers, Sailors and Airmen in the Second World War, which is excellent. And also on the Sarnia Historical website, who've again done a project on, um, on John Diabding um, too. So th that's basically the, the very sad and, and tragic story of, um, of this crew, but we are doing our best to make sure that they are not forgotten. Yeah, I mean, it's I can, only one can speak now, I guess, but if you can leave your comments to those watching, um, it's it's so amazing and so appreciated that the Canadians who went over there so long ago are still remembered. And there's active work being done to to, to remember these, these men and their sacrifices uh, that typically get forgotten. Like you said, like we don't think about that in Canada here really all that much because we focus on certain elements like you and me were talking about before. But it, it's just something great to see that people who live by there now still want this to be remembered and, and those who died who are not from that area, right? Who have no real connection to the area where they crashed. It's just, it's 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 remarkable to, to, to see this. And I do thank you for the work that you've done to bring this story to light and, and working to, to get the memorial done. And again, if there's anything I can do or people can do to help with that, please do let me know and we'll see what we can do. If we need to send even some emails and support, we can always do that. Yeah. So that's something we, I'm sure the people watching would be very interested in. Now, I think we have a few questions. Oh, sure, great. Um, I'm just gonna go back here through in a second. Yeah, we had some good comments and questions. I just want to make sure I got them all covered. Yeah, so this was an interesting point I think we just kind of missed is that, and this is right, because I was doing some research the other day on something else the, for the First World War, and they didn't get their birth certificate till the 1960s. So it's just so interesting that that's what happens, right? You can lie, you can make it up, and your parents will say, yeah, of course, that's when they were born. So I think that's also something that we forget looking back with all the documentation we have uh, uh, nowadays. Uh, what was the other question? 
I know that um, someone's commented that um, this was the last um, yeah, Whitley lost to yeah. Bomber Command, and it was. Yeah, they were withdrawn from training um, there it is. incidents and, and training um, crews not long after this this incident because they were just such a – they were death traps, basically. Um, did, did this incident have anything to do with I think that? It, I think it did, yeah, but it was probably just the, the last of very, very many. Yeah, because I mean, I've I've heard other stories as well. I mean, like we were discussing before, I was reading quite a bit about this, and I will be doing some more recently. But the number of crews that, as we already discussed, that die in training, we'll get to that in more in a second. But it's just the planes that are mentioned are are, are the Whitleys, unfortunately, and, and reminiscences and oral histories that I've been reading. It's it, it's quite it's quite sad that these were left in service so long that that may have contributed. Mm -hmm. to, to more deaths, right? Because again, we don't know. By the same happened. token, there weren't there weren't any sort of because attrition rates were so high. The, yeah. There weren't sort of spare Lancasters and spare Halifaxes, you know, kicking about for people to train on until right. they got into the in, into the heavy conversion unit. So, so there wasn't any choice that these older aircraft had to be used. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, here we go. This is a good question uh, about um, the bomber command casualties and and raids were quite high. But where does that compare to the training losses? Um, as, I, as I've mentioned, I think I mentioned some statistics there. The training losses um, were very, very high. Um, so you've got um, 55,573 um, aircrew killed um, in uh, Bomber Command, um, both operationally and um, in training. Um, Sort of during the entirety of the war, but of those, um, I think there was something like uh, eight or nine thousand were killed in training. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty high. Yeah, it's it's very yeah, high. It, there's a yeah. I mean, it's again. Then there's another comment here. Sorry mm -hmm. about. Uh, yeah. What you got to bear in mind as well that Bomber Command had the highest attrition rate of any mil Allied military unit in the Second well, World War. Yeah, and that's a that's a good point to make because also. Um, Shelter makes a great point here. Um, it's bang on. Avoid the carnage of trench warfare, but then has its own different kind of carnage. It's a different, a completely different kind of carnage. I mean, yeah. the, again, the bomber command casualties, as we keep saying, are so high. But I, I think it is important to keep saying that, a because it's just a fact. But also, I think we tend to lose focus of that here. There's, I don't know if you're aware of all of this, but there's been, there was controversy around Bomber Command in the early 1990s. There was the documentary The Valor Horror, which I'm sure you are aware of, which I talk about a lot, <laughs> but because, and that one's not my expertise, but it just, it's not really understood what that really meant and how the thing, how Bomber Command was presented and all of this caused a lot of anger. And, and, and I still think, even with that episode getting the attention that it did, we still don't really understand this. We talk about, you know, uh, Juno Beach, no problem, you know, going into the, you know, the shell is even getting more attention, that, but I just still think Bomber Command does not fully understand what that actually means in terms of the losses. It's, just, it's, it's, it's changing it's, here very much. So in the last probably 10 to 15 years, it, it's really changed. And um, sort of the, the work that um, the, the Bomber Command, Command crews did and is sort of being evaluated and looked at in a, in a different way and sort of the contribution and the impact of what they were required to do on the individual air crews themselves has been looked at. Um, so many of these guys um, suffered from very severe PTSD, um, mm -hmm. you know, f for the rest of their lives. My Uncle Jack, who I've been talking about and who I, I, who I wrote the book about, um, he never spoke about his experiences after the war. He just, he just couldn't talk about it. Um, and I've interviewed other um, veterans who are obviously in their 90s now, mm. and several of them have told me that they've only just been able to start talking about their experiences now um, because they're just sort of coming to terms with them, but also because they were made to feel ashamed of what mm -hmm. their role in the war was, of what Bomber Command was. Bear right. in mind that we only had... A memorial to bomber command crews unveiled in Britain, a national memorial in 2012, which is insane. I know. You know, 55 and a half thousand of these guys were killed, um, and the war would have taken a very different course, I think, had it not been for their contribution. But 
the strategic bombing campaign was not a war winner in itself, but the war could not have been won without it. That's my view. Yeah, I mean, that's going to be debated, I think, forever. Yeah. <laughs> as long as it's literally remembered by anyone, I think people will discuss it. I mean, we're not uh, here to kind of come to any conclusion about that or anything like that. But I think it is it's misunderstood, like you said. It's getting better. I, I, I do. You do get the sense that, particularly the memorial, which we don't have. Again, we have our own problems with memorials, especially in the Second World War. I mean, Tim Cook's wrote all, written all about this. I'm sure everyone's aware of that. But it, 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 even the one in the UK I've seen from those that unfortunately got to live to see it built, it, it was a big moment for them. They, they, they finally got the recognition that they were in many ways literally denied. So it's it must have been, I don't even know what the right word would be to, 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 to you know, describe that feeling of finally getting recognized. You know? well, these veterans are now um, are very much honoured in the UK, I would say now, uh, very much so honoured and revered and respected for their contribution to, to the war effort. Um, if any of your um, sort of viewers in, in Canada are interested, I suggest that they have a look at the... Um, International Bomber Command Center yeah. website um, in the UK, which is fantastic. It's done some fantastic work around sort of recognition, restitution, um, also um, dealing with the experience of the um, the German civilians as well. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of reconciliation work is you know is, yeah. is being done with them, and, and that's one of the things which I wanted to explore in my book as well. I really wanted to look at the. Um, the German civilian experience, mm -hmm. um, which I have done, I've actually made contact um, with a German family whose um, grandmother was killed on my uncle's first raid on Wuppertal. Wow. And they've given me lots of information. They've been ever so helpful. And they've actually invited me to go and stay with them. Wow. Um, which is, you know, that's quite quite something. Um, that's, I mean, yeah, sorry not to cut you up, but that, that's reconciliation. That That's what that yeah. means. I mean, it's been done so poorly in the past, I would say. Yeah. Uh, and, for, again, I don't want to keep. I always talk about this documentary, but I don't really can't not because it just forms so many Canadians' opinions on this. Yeah. That scene in, in the Bomber Command episode of The Dollar and the Hoarder, where they literally take two guys from Bomber Command, two people who survived the bombing of Hamburg, and seemingly ambush both of them in the middle of a street to talk about this. That's not the yeah. way to do this. This this it's is the way to do little. this. It's. I do think it is important to have um, uh, understanding of what happened, and we have to do that together and i think that you're doing this is great and um, again like i said telling the story writing the books i mean the sidebar is getting all kinds of you're getting all kinds of great comments we'll get to that in a second but uh it's just i'm great that's great to hear that that they're willing to engage with yeah. you and have some reconciliation here because again it well it can't be it can't be even close to easy to what they went through right so it's yeah. it, it's a tricky topic but i think that's the way to do it is just start talking. I don't, I don't really know what else to say. Yeah. Uh, I think you have to sort of, you've got to, you can't just approach it from a, a narrow perspective. You've got to look at it from, you know, from globally, if you like, and you, you've got to look at the impact on, on German civilians. The same way as you've got to look at the impact on British civilians of, you know, of, of Luftwaffe bombing. You've got to look at the impact on those who were taking part. You've got to look at the bigger picture. Well, what what were the aims? Mm -hmm. Why was it like this? What were we, you know, what were the Allies trying to achieve? Um, was there another way at the time? Probably not. You know, in the early part of the war, there were so many yeah. different arguments and so many different perspectives, all equally valid. And you you've got to look at them all and um, to get a balanced picture. You can't just look at it from one point of view. In my opinion, anyway. yeah, and I think that's this is a good start because, again, like I said, I'm very thankful that you've done this now that I've learned about this crew. If I ever get to this area or anywhere close to it, I'm obviously going to go now because and see these, but yeah, as much as I can because I've been just wanting to get over to Western Europe. <laughs> Plus, of course, COVID threw you know wrenches into my plans after the PhD was done and all that stuff, right? like everyone else, but uh, anyway, so it's good to know these details, and I think this is kind of like an unintended um, theme of this week. I didn't plan it like this. I just kind of work with people's schedules, but yours is the second of three personal, personal stories that you normally do not get. You don't hear this. You see a name on a piece of paper or in a file and that's it. You're bringing the detail that is missing. And I think this is great to see. And people again are talking about the book. There's a link to it to buy it in Canada, the UK and the United States. 
down below. Uh, get help from that, but again, get the book that you can, because or and I'm gonna put the links down below. I went down and read them all, <laughs> all the blogs and machines, because they are very well done uh, covering these topics. And this is not her day job, <laughs> so she's doing this really out of interest and doing an amazing job. So please do check those out, and her link to her Twitter is also uh, down below. Uh, so there's a couple things I did just want to wrap up because I think they are important because we were talking about. Um, the losses. So Sheldrake, who I know knows this stuff and can research real quick, got a number uh, for the, the accidents of the RCAF at least. So th that's a lot. <laughs> that's a huge number. Uh, of that number may just be RCAF, but it may also be um, in addition, it may include, or there may be right. addition, the um, Canadians who actually served with the RAF rather than the RCAF, of which right, they were. which and that is always a bit of a, a great It's very area. difficult to find the figures. Yeah, it's very difficult to separate, you know, what that means. And again, it's it's a bit of a confusing confusing part, but it's, it's you're right, it's still unknown. But I mean, just the scale, it's only going to go up. That number would only go up, not down. So it's just, it's, 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 I mean, again, it's just shocking. And there was another one too. Sorry, just give me a second. Lots of good talk about your book, <laughs> which is great to see in the sidebar. Yeah, everyone's singing your praises. I, uh, I like to see that. Um, oh, yeah, it was just another comment from Gary just saying he's just he was just shocked um, about the numbers. And from being from training, right, that's not something you expect from the Second World War, especially, right? That's not something you expect. But, yes, they didn't have flight simulators. Uh, not to the degree we have today, not even close, but uh, there was some things, but they didn't quite. Uh, Very steep learning curve. Yeah. I remember really some good. of these pilots are like, you know, the 19. Yeah. Um, some of the very good pilots were 19, um, but, you know, a lot of them were very young kids. Um, yeah, young. That level of responsibility, because not only for the, you know, the machine that they are in charge of, but also the responsibility for the lives of their crewmates as well. Mm -hmm. um, it's a, it's a Horrendous. Well, like we were talking before we started, some of the, the pilots were 19. Yeah. And, and the way it was run, sometimes they were at the beginning of the war, they weren't officers, but they mm -hmm. were given charge because you're the pilot. You're mm -hmm. 19. You may be in charge of a, an officer who's like mid 20s. Like, I mean, it's just so much to think about. I mean, it's just, I, it's some, it's a lot of questions. It's a lot of things to sit and think about. Uh, and I think you're doing a good job. So one thing I, I would like to, to mention, and that is the fact that um, the British people generally, I would say, are very appreciative of the role that um, Canadians and other Commonwealth um, nations um, played in the war, particularly in the, the contribution that they made um, to um, the RAF um, and, and Bomber Command, because obviously so many of them served here. Um, and so many of them that never got home. And we really, really do appreciate that. Yeah, and, and again, I just can say thank you for myself, but for those of you who are doing this actual groundwork, literally, <laughs> with your photos and everything, it's uh, it's great to see. So thanks again for coming on. Uh, it was it was really right. really a great experience to, to hear this in depth uh, that you can talk about, right, and I can throw questions at you. So it was really, really good to, to be able to kind of get to that level. But again, I think you did an amazing job covering pretty much all the questions I had from doing all the reading you gave me. So it, it, it's amazing to see this. And hopefully I get a chance to read your book soon. I <laughs> just I get so busy. But Put it on the pile, yeah. I know, the pile is probably as tall as I am. Pile of shame. Yeah, the pile of, yes, as it's called the pile of shame by many. Uh, and I'm not a short man. I think my pile's as tall as me. But uh, <laughs> Uh, anyway, so I'm just going to do a quick sign up and I'll come say bye and we'll, we'll end it. Uh, so thanks everyone for watching. This was a really uh, a great live stream. Again, looking at this personal lever, level of loss in war and how that can come about and what that means. And obviously, and we've had a comment here. Sorry, just a, <laughs> kind of popping up at the end here. But it was read during the show. But the epitaph on... Um, on John Downing's grave, who was only 17 uh, at the time, is is something to see. So uh, again, I just want to let everybody know uh, the book that's been talked about great in the sidebar is available for sale. If you do buy through those links, it helps me out, uh, which I would tremendously appreciate. Like I said, if you haven't subscribed, please do. 
it really, really helps me uh, trying to build up these numbers, trying to get to that thousand mark. It's like a big goal for me to get to. Uh, and I'd like to get there as soon as possible. But also, if you enjoy the shows and these topics and you want to keep seeing more, please support me on Patreon and buy me a coffee again. Links are down below. I, again, I talked about this last night at the end of the presentation. I, I need a little more support to keep going here. Uh, it's it's getting a bit tough to continue to do. And I want to do this and have great guests like Jane on here to talk about these things. So if you can do anything to help, uh, it's so greatly appreciated if you can support me in any way. Uh, it'll just help me keep doing this and I don't want to stop. So let, let's, uh, it'll be great to see some, some, some support. So thanks again, everyone for watching. So thanks again, Jane, for coming on. I'll say this a thousand times again, but great stuff, great work, and I really appreciate Enjoyed it. Thank you. On. Yeah, so if you get more, when you get that more work done, we're going to have you back because uh, I want to hear more. So you're going to, based on your old work, your great new work is going to be just as good. So uh, really looking forward to getting more from you. So thanks again, everyone, for watching. And uh, there's another live stream coming up in two days. Uh, again, just look up for details on, on YouTube and on social media. So everyone will check that out. So thanks, everyone. Have a good day. Hey.